everybody. Uh, this is a talk that was going to be called Reactive Streams in Angular 1 and 2. Uh, I'm here to tell you I'm a dirty liar. I'm not going to talk about Angular 1 at all. Uh, what I'll suggest is we talked about Angular 1 at ngconf uh, using Rx. You can watch that. It was uh, myself and uh, Martin Gontovnikas, um, also known as Gonto. Uh, the reason this talk changed is because Jeff Cross and Rob Wormald, who are here in the front row, ruined my week last week and made me rewrite, rewrite my talk because we had identical talks. We want to cover uh, more material for you. Uh, so what we opted to do is have me explain more detail about RxJS because it's, it's becoming more pivotal in Angular 2. Who am I? I am Ben Lesh. I am a senior UI engineer on the Edge Developer Experience team at Netflix. Uh, I work a lot of, on a lot of real-time uh, streaming applications. And I'm also uh, the project lead on RxJS Next, which can be found on GitHub here. Um, so one announcement that I'd like to make is RxJS Next is now RxJS 5 Alpha. Uh, this is a big deal. It's very, very um, awesome that we were at Alpha release. It's been dubbed RxJS 5 by Matt Padraseki, the uh, creator of RxJS. Um, so a little bit about RxJS 5 first. Uh, RxJS 5 is a community-driven uh, project. So there are people at Netflix, Google, and Microsoft actively contributing to RxJS 5 as well as other um, private contrib contributors under the ReactiveX community banner. Uh, we've got specific goals with RxJS 5. It was rewritten from the ground up, primarily for performance is, is the primary goal. Secondary goal is improved debugging, and I'll, get, I'll show you a little bit about th that in a bit. Um, and the other goal was to try to match the ES7 observable spec. So what that means is some of you will notice that uh, Methods like on next have be become just next, and uncompleted has just become completed. And this is try to get it in line with JavaScript standards in the future. So let's talk about the first major goal there, performance. Uh, all of the decisions we made were gui guided by performance tests. We went through a good f somewhere between four and six different architectures, tested them against each other to see which one was fastest, uh, and finally ended up on one that's called a lift architecture that was, that was developed by Paul Taylor. Um, we've got more than 120 micro performance tests, and we also have 10 to 12 macro performance tests using Angular's uh, bench press tool that uh, cover common bottlenecks and uh, potential memory leaky areas of, of uh, RxJS. So RxJS 5 operators are uh, 4.3 times faster on average. Uh, the, some of them are actually up to 26 times faster, depending on what you're, what you're looking at. Now, operators, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk a little bit about what an operator is in a little bit, if you're not familiar. Um, the, other, the other win was for debuggability. The call stack depth is much, much lower uh, now. It was a common complaint around Netflix. Uh, you'll be trying to debug something that's happening in your Rx stack, and you, you look at the, the call stack, and you're like, oh, I don't even know where this is. Um, I think we've all had that happen in code. Uh, just a really quick example to, to show you. Here's a, a flame chart in RxJS4 uh, running some code, and you see that the, the depth gets pretty high, and it's pretty complicated through the middle. There's a lot of little tiny calls. Uh, in RxJS5, this is exactly the same code running. You can see that the complicate, it's not quite as complicated, not quite as deep, and it actually executes uh, faster. Uh, this has a lot to do with how we change scheduling around or default scheduling around. So I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without uh, Great contributions from people like Paul Taylor, OJ Kwan, Andre Stoltz, and Jeff Cross. Paul Taylor came with the architecture that we work on. OJ and Andre are prolific contributors, and Jeff has really helped us out with our build tooling. So really, every one of our contributors has been uh, very, very helpful. I encourage you to go here and check out the list. It's small but growing. And while you're there, submit a PR for me. That would be great. Uh, there's a lot of work left to do to get it out of, out of um, alpha and into beta. I'd also like to thank these folks here, uh, Matt Padwasecki, uh, Jafar Hussein, Eric Meyer, Ben Christensen, George Campbell, and Aaron, Aaron Tull. They've been critical in guiding me and our team through um, common problems that they've experienced developing uh, similar RxJS or Rx architectures. So we're closing out on beta in the next month or so. Uh, the, the work that needs to be done still is mostly around shoring up tests. 
uh, that's, that's the biggest thing, and, and also getting the, the docs uh, in, a, in a better place. So it's not going to change the API very much. Uh, flat map's going to be flat map long after I'm dead and gone, so I don't expect there to be a lot of pull requests around, around a lot of the operators. All right, so I just told you all about RxJS5, but what, if, what is it? Uh, there's a few of you probably asking that. Um, it's reactive programming. That's pretty vague. Uh, it, you can treat events as collections. So this is, this is where the power comes from. And you can manipulate these sets of events with operators. Uh, another way I've heard it put, which I like a lot, is RxJS is low dash or underscore for async, because you can treat all of your events or anything really as a set. Angular 2 is using RxJS 5 observables for async. Uh, that's why I'm up here in front of you, of course. Angular has traditionally used promises for async. So this is a bone of contention with people. Oh, I just learned promises, and you're making me learn this new observable thing. I'm not, I'm not making you. You can still use promises if you like. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between promises and observable and, and try to explain how observables work on the way. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'm also going to show an example of a multiplex WebSocket that reconnects itself. Uh, so promises. Uh, what are promises? Promises are a read-only view to a single future value. Uh, they have success in error semantics via then. Um, they also have mapping semantics and that sort of thing via then. They're not lazy. By the time you have a promise, it's on its way to resolving or rejecting. Uh, they're immutable and uncancelable. That's actually the best feature of promises. Your promise will resolve or reject eventually. So an observable, on the other hand, is uh, streams. You hear them called streams sometimes, but they're really sets of zero to n things, so zero to many things over any amount of time. They're lazy. They don't actually, if you have an observable, nothing's happening until you call subscribe on it. And uh, they can be unsubscribed from. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. That means that it'll tear down that, that producer that, that's giving you values over your observable. It's a powerful feature. So both observables and promises were, were built to solve problems around asynchrony. Uh, to avoid you know, callback hell was the, big, was the big term whenever promises were being pimped around. Uh, let's talk about async in modern web applications. So async in modern web applications uh, really boils down to uh, DOM events, animations, AJAX, WebSockets, server sent events, and then other alternative inputs like joystick and audio that could probably really be labeled as DOM events. So which of these are promises really good for? Um, there's DOM events, which are more than one value, so probably not that one. Animations are cancelable, so not really that. AJAX is one value. Uh, WebSocket, server percent events, and the, the other alternative inputs are all more than one value or maybe no values at all. So those aren't very great for promises. So really, uh, the, only, the only thing promises make sense for out of this entire list is AJAX, except for when promises don't make sense for AJAX. So all of us here are here. We work in Angular, and, and we're building single-page applications. So single-page applications commonly load AJAX for each view. Uh, they prepare data for, for the view with, with AJAX. And uh, when you change the view, the, the new view doesn't care about the, the data from the, the previous view. I think a few of you are know, know where I'm going with this. Uh, XHRs can actually be aborted. There's an abort function on your XHR to stop it from doing what it's doing. Unfortunately, though, promise-based AJAX libraries uh, aren't cancelable. They don't allow you to abort that AJAX call. What you end up doing is you, you're then fires successfully, and you have some little piece of mutable state in there that says, hey, I, I, I don't want this one. This, this one's too old, or I, I don't want this one because I've changed my view. So that's, that's not great. Uh, Observables have that cancellation semantic, though, so let's, let's talk about how we go from promises to observables. What, what are the similarities? Where, where can I start if I only know promises right now? They have similar semantics. So if I have a promise x, and I'm calling then on it, and I have my value function to handle success, and my error function to handle if it, if it errors, to use an observable, all I really need to do if x becomes an observable instead of a promise is call subscribe in exactly the same way. Now my value function is going to, get, going to be called zero to n times for however many values my observable emits. My error function could be called if there's an error. 
but I need to know when it completes. And I don't always need to know when it completes, but I need some sort of way to figure out when, when it completes. And for that, just one more handler, which is the completion function. So very similar. The one nice difference here, though, is that uh, Observable also has cancellation semantics. So it's going to return a subscription on which I can call unsubscribe at a later time and tell the Observable, stop sending me values or don't send me any more values at all. So creating Observables is also similar to creating promises. I think that a lot of you that are familiar with promises have seen a promise created before like this. This is a promise constructor to which we've passed a function. It gives us a resolve and reject. We do some asynchronous thing. If we have an error, we call reject with the error. If we get a value, then we call resolve with the value. Create an observable, same thing, really. There's a new observable constructor. We give it a function that gives us an observer uh, instead of resolve or reject. We call observer error if there's an error, and we call observer next if we get a value. We can call next however many times we want. We could not call it at all. We could call it dozens of times. And then finally, when we're sure we're done, we can call complete. And even that's actually op optional. You could have an observable that never ends if you, if you so chose. So uh, if the observable's resource, if the, if the producer's resource, that, that uh, do async thing method I had in the previous slide, gives me some sort of cancellation, uh, like set timeout, for example. Uh, set timeout will give you a token. Uh, we can actually handle that here. What we can do is we can capture the token, and then that function you pass to the observable constructor, you can have it return a function. And that function you return is your unsubscribe method. That, that's going to be called whenever you unsubscribe to tear down uh, resources like a WebSocket or an XHR abort, for example. So this is what happens when you call subscribe. The moment you call subscribe, it's actually going to execute the body of this function and set, set up your producer to start sending you values. Again, this doesn't happen just because you have an observable. You have to call subscribe. When you call unsubscribe, it's going to call whatever function you've returned in there. That's going to, that's going to execute the logic to tear down your producer. So if this seems a little complicated, don't worry. You're not likely to be creating your own observables in this way very often. Uh, there's a lot of creation helpers in uh, RxJS. There's observable of, uh, which is similar to array of, where you just pass it a bunch of values, and it creates an observable of those, from those values. There's observable from, which is very powerful. You can pass it any promise, any iterable, like a generator or an array, or uh, any observable, lowercase o observable. And what that could be is something like uh, kefir observable or bacon or uh, most JS. As long as they've implemented the symbol observable uh, uh, method on there that returns a, an object that has a subscribe function on it, it'll work in here. So moving on to error handling uh, in observables is also similar to promises. In a promise, you've got a catch, right? We've, we've used this before, and the idea is it gives you the error. You can check something about the error, and if it's OK, you return a new promise that's resolved. Otherwise, you can just throw the error or return a rejected promise. Same thing in observable. You, it, there's a catch uh, operator that gives you an error. You can analyze the error, return a new observable if it's OK. Otherwise, you can throw the error or return a uh, thrown observable. There's finally, which here it is in the promise. If, if your promise impl has finally, this is what it would look like. Exactly the same in observable, no different. One nice difference, though, is because observables are lazy, observables can be retried. So if you have a promise that fails and you want to retry that logic, you better still have a hold of that function that produced that promise. With an observable, the observable essentially is a function. So if you have an observable and it failed, you can subscribe to it again, or you can even just wire it up with retry. It'll retry three times or retry when, which I'll demonstrate in a little bit with the WebSocket. Quick recap on observable. An observable is any number of things over any amount of time. All values are pushed to the next handler, which is the first argument to uh, subscribe. If there's an error, it goes to the error handler, which is the second argument. And if you want to know when it's completed, you provide a completion handler. Observables are lazy. They don't do anything until you call subscribe. And when you call subscribe, it returns a subscription, which has an unsubscribe method on it, 
which you can call at any later time to tell the observable to stop producing values. One thing to know about that is if you tell it to stop producing values, that's the producer telling the consumer it knows it's done, so the completion handler won't fire. The completion handler is for when the producer wants to tell the consumer that it's done successfully. All right, so I mentioned operators earlier. What, what is an operator? Um, really, they're, they're methods on observable that return other observables. They, they allow you to compose new observables from, from the observable you're on. Here's a little bit of how they work. So let's say I have my, my operator operator. It's a great name for an operator. If you make one yourself, I suggest that. Uh, you call it on source, and it returns a result. Result is an observable that when you subscribe to it, actually subscribes to source under the hood and transforms its values somehow. Um, maybe it's filtering them out or whatever, and then emits those values. So I've, I've caused two subscriptions when I could subscribe to a uh, result, but I get one subscription back. If I unsubscribe from that subscription I get back from result, it's going to unsubscribe from that inner subscription to source. So that means my unsubscriptions are actually composed through. That also enables you to do some pretty powerful stuff. So operators, this, this is another, another nuance of operators. Operators are a little bit different than what you might be familiar with with, uh, say, array operators like array, filter, map, and reduce in that operators pass each value that are emitted into the observable through to the next operation one by one. Um, there's an asterisk here I'll get to in a second. The, this is different from arrays because arrays, when you, when you operate on an array with filter or map, it'll go through the entire array, produce a new array. You map it, it goes through the entire array, produces another array, right? The asterisk there is because you can actually change this, this behavior with schedulers. I'd love to get into this today. There's absolutely not enough time to do that. Uh, for the most part, you generally don't have to worry about schedulers. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, but here's, a, here's a, a quick animation of what using operators in an array looks like. I'm filtering, then I'm mapping to squares, then I'm gonna reduce to a stack. And you'll see these, these two stacks in the middle are actually arrays that were created by each step. So one, one thing to know about this is if you're doing this on really huge arrays, if you're doing it on small arrays, this is gonna be much faster than using an observable. So if you have small arrays you're dealing with and you wanna filter and map, don't use observable for that. If they're large arrays though, all of these, these, these interme intermediary arrays here, they're gonna be, need to be garbage collected at some point, right? And garbage collection eats your thread. You also are, going through every single one of them each time, so it's computationally expensive. In an observable, each, uh, each value is gonna go all the way through, uh, kind of like a transducer, to the end as, as it goes through. So no intermediary arrays produce uh, a lot more efficient. However, again, I would caution you not to do that with small arrays because it, it'll be a little bit slower. It's, it's when you, you get up into larger sized arrays. I'm gonna blow through this because I don't have a lot of time. I timed myself yesterday. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the operators. There are things you're familiar with like map, filter, and reduce. Uh, take and skip, pretty self-explanatory. These are all operators that do things synchronously. Um, you'll get familiar with them as you, as you play around. There's uh, also merging and joining operators. These ones are really important. So the ones you wanna learn are things like merge or merge map, which is also known as flat map or concat. Uh, switch map was demonstrated actually in, in Jeff and Rob's talk, uh, also known as flat map latest, which I believe uh, what Ganto complained about in his talk. He was ragging on me. Well, maybe we'll do an alias for that one. I don't know. Uh, there's also ways to split observables into many other observables by grouping them um, or doing windows or partitioning them. Finally, there's buffering strategy. So you can actually set up a buffer that over time, you can say, okay, take all the values and keep them because I, I want to space these out, but I don't want to lose any of them. Or there's throttle, debounce, and sample, which are lossy buffering strategies where you're saying, just give me a value after a certain delay or give me whatever the most recent value was from this observable at this point. With ES7 function binds, which I'm super excited about, uh, there's, a, there's a branch on TypeScript that has this implemented and I really hope it gets merged soon. ES7 function bind, you can roll your own. And what I mean by this is you can create any function you want where this on the inside is your source observable, and then you can say my observable colon colon my operator. You can implement the my operator operator, which I recommended before, a great name for an operator. 
So that, that hopefully is coming soon to TypeScript. You can already do it in Babel. Uh, I love this, this way of extending observable. A uh, quick point on hot versus cold observables. If you've ever heard this term before, all observables are by default cold. And what that means is when you subscribe to it, it sets up one producer for that consumer. And the next time you subscribe to it, it sets up one producer again, executes that logic in the inside for one consumer. If you were to make it hot by calling share on it, for example, that means you have one producer for many consumers. And you'll do this, we're gonna do this with the WebSocket in a bit. Uh, you'll do this if you don't wanna set up you know, a whole bunch of WebSockets for every observable you've filtered and mapped off of it. All right, multiplex WebSocket. Why is observable a great fit for this? We actually do this on uh, several of the apps I work on at Netflix. So a multiplex WebSocket, here's the problem you have to solve. You have to connect to a, a WebSocket server. For each data stream, so multiplexing means I'm sending multiple data streams over the socket. For each data stream, uh, I'm sending a subscription message to the server. So I need to know what to send to the server. I have to filter out responses from the server that are specific to that message. And then uh, when I'm done, I need to send an unsubscription message back to the server. So if I no longer care about that data stream in my view for some reason, I need to notify the server to stop sending me values. Ideally, if I'm not multiplexing anything over the socket, we want to close down that socket because we don't want to waste valuable server resources, right? Uh, it gets a little grosser when you have to reconnect. So if you're walking, you got your WebSocket app, you walk between buildings, or you go outside, or you're on a mobile device, you have a spotty connection, that socket is going to disconnect. And what do you do with all that other information that I just showed you? You've got to maintain a state to, so you know what all subscriptions you have in your view right now. So you've got to maintain that somewhere if you're doing imperative, imperative programming. Uh, you have to check to see, like poll, to see when you're able to reconnect or wait for an online event to fire. And then you need to reconnect to the socket when you're able to. And once the socket is, is reopened, you have to send all of those uh, subscription messages back to the server to tell it to start sending you values again. This is, this is complicated. This gets really hairy if you're trying to do this with imperative programming. You're, you're almost guaranteed to miss something in your tests trying to do this. So how do we do this with uh, an observable? I'm sorry if this is a little small. I didn't have time to, to clean, clean up my uh, stuff. Ho hopefully most people can see this. What I'm going to end up doing, and this looks like a lot of code, but it's, it's actually not that much, is I create an observable that wraps a WebSocket. So when you subscribe, it's going to create a new instance of a WebSocket. That's actually what causes WebSockets to connect. And then on the on message events on that WebSocket, we're going to pump our values out of our observable. So now basically I'm going to have this observable of uh, WebSocket messages. And then when I unsubscribe, I want to close the socket. Right, so all I'm doing here is, is, is just a straight observable of nothing but raw WebSocket messages. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to call share in this. And this share is going to make it hot. That means that if I have many things subscribe over this WebSocket, it's not going to create multiple WebSocket connections because that wouldn't be good. Now we need to multiplex it. In order to do that, I'm going to create an observable that wraps my socket observable. So. In order to wrap it, that means that when I call subscribe on my multiplex uh, data stream here, it's going to subscribe to my socket observable and filter out the messages that it cares about. Then it's going to send a message, uh, this is again on subscription, it's going to send a message to the server to say, hey, start sending me values. And when I unsubscribe, I want to send a message to the server that says, hey, server, stop sending me values, and then I'm going to tear down that subscription to that shared socket. And un under the hood, that share method that I called earlier on the web socket keeps a ref count. If that ref count gets back down to zero, it disposes and cleans up the, the web socket, closes the web socket. Finally, to handle our, our situation whenever we uh, lose, lose co connectivity, I'm gonna add this retry when. And what this essentially does is it provides me a stream of errors and I can switch map that stream of errors out into any event. And when that event fires, it's going to notify, hey, go ahead and retry uh, subscribing to this observable again. So in this case, uh, the top line there is I'm updating the connection state. And that's just so we can see what's going on. But the bottom line there is I'm saying if we're, if we're online, 
then just wait three seconds and, and emit a value and, and we'll, we'll try to retry it. But if I'm not online, then wait for one window online event and, and go ahead and, and connect. Then the last thing, and this is important, is we need to share this observable as well. And the reason we share this one is we don't want, if we have many different subscribers to this observable, we don't want to send the server a whole bunch of subscribe messages that are exactly the same. We only need to send it once, so we can share this. All right, example time. I, um, I'm not as, as brave as, as Sarah Robinson. I'm not going to live code anything right now. Um, that's really brave. Here's, uh, ooh, where am I going? So this, this, is, the, this is the example that uh, Rob and, and Jeff showed you the other day, and it's got the type ahead. This is the common RxJS thing where they type something and it's doing the autocomplete sort of deal. I'm going to select of any value from this, and you'll see values start ticking in into this chart. This is random stock values. It's, I would hate if my company's stocks were doing it this crazy. It's Netflix, though. It's close. It's close. Um, I can add another one. Uh, a thing I want you to notice is up here in the corner, we've got this, uh, it says connected, right? And if I go in and I close one down, I'm still connected. But if I close down the other one, it automatically disconnects. And the reason for this is, is every time you're selecting a value, what it's doing is it's adding to this array of tickers. Uh, and then we're, we're taking the, the ticker, which, which has an observ our observable, our multiplex observable in it, and adding it to the view. So just by virtue of the fact it's been added to the view, uh, it's going to subscribe. And you can do this with Rx pipes. It's probably the most powerful feature. I wish this showed a little bit more of that, this particular example. But just by adding it to the view, it's going to subscribe to that, uh, to that observable and start pumping values, like do all the, all the work of connecting to the socket, sending the subscription, taking the values, writing them out to my graph. Then when I remove everything, as I remove each value, it just removes it from the view. And on destroy, I'm unsubscribing from that, that underlying subscription. And that means that uh, it's, it's going to send the unsubscription message to the server. And eventually, when I get my ref count down to zero, it's going to close that WebSocket. But that's not all. We've, we've got more to show because we, uh, we have this reconnection logic. So let's add a couple symbols here. So you can see this ticking in. And what I can do is I can go over here and I can just kill this server that's giving me values. No, it's sad. It stopped. If you look up here, there's state now says retrying, which is that code it hit in my retry when logic to update the, the connection state. And I can go back and start it up. And uh, moment of truth, we wait a couple seconds. And it starts ticking back in. And that's all I had to do is add that retry when. If I took that off there, that behavior is gone. All right, wrapping up, it's yelling at me over here saying time's up. Never trust anybody with only good things to say about their library or framework. That's, that's a fact, just don't do that. They're, they're blowing smoke at you. Here's the, here's the bad in RxJS. So the, the top one that I'll warn you about is Zalgo. I don't know how many of you people are familiar with Zalgo. Zalgo is this evil monster that occurs when you have a function that executes sometimes synchronously and sometimes asynchronously. Observables will execute as fast as they can. So if you have an observable over an array, you can iterate over an array synchronously. So if you call subscribe on it, that subscribe block will execute synchronously. Uh, if you have an observable over something async, which is much more likely and, and much more recommended, it's going to execute that asynchronously. So it's something to be aware of. It can bite you. Um, the other thing that you can run into is unbounded buffers. Uh, there's a few operators that have this. Zip is a, is a good example of this. So zip, when you're doing it with arrays, what it does is it matches up indices and says, OK, indice 0, match them together, do something with them, add them to my new array. Indice 1, match them together, do something with them, add them to my array. So if you're zipping two observables, A and B, since they happen over time, you don't know when they're coming in. So A comes in. And B hasn't arrived yet, so you have to buffer the value that came in in A. Another value arrives in A, you have to buffer that value too. Then B comes in, you say, oh, look, there's two things in my buffers. 
Let's go ahead and zip them together and emit a new value. So if you have a long-running zipped observable of A values that are coming in much, much faster than B values, you're going to get that A buffer building up, and you can run into memory issues. And the final, final one, and I think you actually saw this in my slide, is there are too many operators to remember. Uh, really, you can get by with uh, eight operators or so that are really commonly used. Don't let the number of operators uh, seem too daunting. Um, there, there are a few that are really powerful, like expand, that you'll probably not use very often. Uh, there are ones that you'll use all the time, like flat map or merge or map, that sort of thing. So that's it. Uh, good, this is my contact information. Good would be comments, better is questions, and the best thing you can do is offer up corrections. I love to learn new things. So feel free to contact me. That's also my personal email. I like to chat about this stuff anytime. Thank you very much.